Okay, um, well, my next guest uh, is uh, a political analyst, and she's actually a senior associate at the Anthony's College of Oxford University. Um, and she has a Master's of International Affairs, a degree from Columbia University. And actually, she was a blogger at the Huffington Post. And if you've been watching Alex Jones, you would know that he interviewed the CNN journalist Amber Leung, uh, who lost her job with CNN over her reporting of the Bahrain Revolution. Well, you know, uh, Bahrain being a um, country that you know is is already controlled by the U.S. hegemony, so uh, having a revolution there wasn't very good for the um, the people in power. So of course the media, the mainstream media, wasn't reporting on it. Um, so with C this CNN journalist being brave enough to step up and talk about it, uh, she lost her job. And actually the same thing happened to Sharmin Narwani, our next guest, who has been censored by the Huffington Post. And she's here to talk to us about some of the things that she wrote that was censored uh, by the mainstream media. Hello, Sharmin, are you there? Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Charmin. Good, thank you. And you? Very good. Looking forward to this. Okay, well, um, first of all, you've been to Syria twice, I believe, in the last two years. Could you just tell us uh, how your experience there set, changed your mind or set up your thoughts on Syria? Um, yeah, actually, I've been to Syria three times this year already, and uh, when, when I started writing about Syria, I think the first article I ever wrote was in December. It was a, it was a hard one because there were so many conflicting views on um, and reports about what was taking place there, um, as, as you well know, and, and that continues to this day. It's quite remarkable. Um, and, and, and there's, there's even evidentiary stuff that, that, uh, sometimes backs both sides. So it is a confusing story. And, uh, I started off by writing about the Arab League, um, decisions regarding Syria because that was a new development in, in the Middle East, the Arab League taking a very active role suddenly in, in deciding the fate of, of, um, it, its neighbors and, uh, uh, as it had done with Libya as well, right before that. Um, and then, you know, I, I thought it was a bit dodgy the way suddenly um, certain members of the Arab League had catapulted to prominence and were um, not only leading the way, but smacking other member states into obedience. And, um, and then I came across a, a piece by Stratford, the American, uh, uh, the U.S.-based risk analysis or intelligence group. And um, Stratford wrote something very interesting. It actually bucked the narratives on Syria and said that, uh, that um, the opposition, the organized opposition outside of Syria, um, was lying and lying big and gave four different um, uh, pieces of evidence to, to back this up and said that the, the opposition was digging themselves a hole by doing this and, you know, everyone, all the legitimate opposition would also be um, tainted by this if, if, if this kind of thing continued. Um, and it was something along the lines of what I was feeling. I was feeling like there was, uh, you know, something missing from the Syrian story. It didn't make sense to me. So I took my first trip in January and... Um, it was, I, I won't say it was a life-changing trip because, I mean, but it, but it did confirm some things um, for me. First of all, it confirmed to me that there was a significant segment of the Syrian population that was still behind their president or had not turned against him. Um, I, uh, you know, and how did I see this? I mean, for instance, going to Syria, I saw... Uh, immediately, things that I hadn't seen during previous trips, um, well before the Arab awakenings hit the region, which was, you know, Facebook was available. I could see the um, much vilified Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya on TV. I could even see the U.S. sponsored Al Hora on my TV screens there. Um, you know, I, I, I witnessed a very big pro Assad demonstration that for me um, was notably not picked up anywhere in the West. Um, I did see snippets of this demonstration on YouTube, um, but amazingly showing very, very few people in the crowds. I actually got there before, um, now this is the big pro-regime demonstration where Assad and his wife and I think two of their children showed up. I got there after 
the Assads um, spoke. Uh, I, I had, uh, I, I was, I think I, I had a meeting or something. I got there after they spoke, and the crowds were, were huge still. I videotaped it and I put it online. Um, but, but these YouTube videos showed no crowds. Um, whereas for hours after the Assads left, there were, you know, Syrians uh, of all ages, you know, with the Islamist hijab, without, um, of all walks of life, soldiers, you know, um, civilians laughing, dancing, doing traditional Arabic dances, the dabke, um, and, and waving flags. And so I thought, well, you know, here's something you're not reading about. And I, I took that trip. Um, I took the opportunity to speak to a number of domestic opposition figures who were very known among Syrians, as opposed to, you know, the, the Syrian National Council we've been hearing about outside um, with, with members who most Syrians did not recognize. So I went to um, speak with domestic opposition figures who um, had been in uh, Syrian jails, some for up to a decade, um, and were well known or relatively well known within the Syrian populace. Um, what I got from that was also striking uh, to a person. They rejected any foreign intervention. They rejected the militarization of this conflict and they rejected sanctions. Um, so, you know, it was eye opening in that I saw that there is an entirely different Syrian body politic, even in, in, in opposition. To the, to the Syrian government um, that uh, is not represented whatsoever in, in the um, Western media and much of the sort of Saudi-owned, I guess, um, Arab, Arab media. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting. And it was another thing, I think, um, that, that struck me during this trip was um, I spoke to some NGOs and, um, you know, off the record, they were, they were telling me about... Um, uh, sort of in, in conflict or conflicted areas of Syria where there was there were casualties that it was not a simple matter that there were um, you know armed people shooting at soldiers and um, and other officials policemen etc um, and you know and that this was not a straightforward conflict as was being reported which led me to you know I've done a lot of pieces on Syria now but I think my uh, for me, my most important piece that came out of this trip was um, one on the Syrian casualty list. And I, I draw your attention to this because it's kind of the crux of the whole matter. I mean, you know, people are screaming humanitarian crisis and people are talking about, you know, humanitarian intervention basically because of this list, this ever-growing list with, you know, numbers that, started off in hundreds and then thousands and, and now you know apparently above 20,000 um and and I interviewed I came back from Syria that first trip and I interviewed um the United Nations the um office of the high commissioner for human rights um I interviewed uh, the red cross the red crescent in Syria I interviewed um some of the uh the the casualty counting groups who are in opposition to the Syrian government and and uh, what I what I sort of gleaned from all this research was that, and this, this was published back in February of this year, um, was that there is parity in um, the numbers of people killed on both sides. So there is no disproportionate um, Syrian regime response to, um, to a sort of peaceful civilian protests around the country. Um, and I pointed out to the fact that even from as early as April 2011, so a few weeks after the first protests were seen in Dera'a, um, you, you, um, uh, you had incidents where, um, for instance, in, in Tartus, in Banyas, where um, nine police officers were shot in a vehicle, um, and, uh, you know, and, and other incidents where off-duty policemen or soldiers, even a general um, with his, traveling with his two sons and a nephew, were killed in cold blood. And these were acts of provocations to elicit, in my view, a response from the Syrian armed forces to then, you know, um, create the storyline of the Arab Spring in Syria you know, brutal regime repressing us 
um, using using um, you know um, heavy weapons and you know um, not rubber bullets, you know uh, weapons to kill. And and uh, so so this civilian list uh, or this casualty list story was an important one because it still remains to this day the the crux of the argument for for why people are you know sanctioning Syria, why they're talking about military intervention, why they're talking about creating humanitarian corridors. It's all because of this perception that the Sir, the Syrian government is slaughtering. Um, unarmed, innocent civilians who are just, um, you know, uh, voicing their, their their right to a freer, more democratic mm -hmm. society, which clearly Syria pr could probably do with, um, but but it's not what's happening in Syria. Uh, sure. I, I, I posit from the beginning, it, it is actually um, very even on both sides. The the, the brutalities and the killing um, have have reached parity from very early on. So as your, you know, reporting became increasingly anti-insurgency, you weren't to towing the mainstream media line. Uh, you wrote that the Huffington Post actually began, but began to censor your blog post about Syria. Can you just tell us about your experience with that? Yeah, well, um, I wouldn't say it, they waited, and I wouldn't say that it became my my writing became increasingly anti-insurgent. Um, I I questioned, I simply questioned, and I um, I did investigative work, and I which is not my thing because I write commentary and analysis. Um, but uh, you know, this Syria was so confusing. So you know, one did one sort of went you know read between the lines and went deeper and and try to get original sourcing and uh, and I you know as I wrote these stories it, it wasn't I, I think people viewed me as being pro-regime which was not at all the case because I was never speaking to anyone in the regime I was always only speaking to domestic opposition figures and not the ones you know bandied around by um, the mainstream media um, but uh, the I, I think the, the, the Huffington Post changed uh, with me at least um, when AOL purchased it in um, early 2011, this was the first time I saw any censorship. Prior to that, really, I could write about anything, and my tone hasn't changed very much about uh, how I report on the Middle East. You know, when the Huffington Post had first engaged me, the, the world editor at the time, who was the founding world editor, was very excited about a trip I was making to the Middle East where I was interviewing for the first time senior members of Hezbollah and Hamas, you know, um, so here was the Huffington Post, very keen to hear alternative viewpoints from the Middle East. And don't forget, both these organizations were on the U.S. list of terror terrorist uh, organizations. So, um, you know, it was a bold, it was a bold new world. The blogosphere and the Huffington Post was taking the lead um, and, and not censoring voices and allowing voices like mine an opportunity to be heard. When AOL purchased the Huffington Post, the first time I saw any of my work censored. Uh, the first was a piece on Hezbollah's or allegations that Hezbollah had scuds, which has been an old Israeli allegation. Um, and I'd, I'd actually started researching this in 2009. So um, when, a, when a terrible article in the, in the Times of London came out on it, I, I used that as an opportunity to, to, to sort of showcase my research on whether Hezbollah had scuds or not. That was censored. Um, there was another piece that was censored later um, last year, uh, which was on the Iran-Saudi assassination hoax, which I called a hoax. Um, and and then uh, the very first piece I wrote on Syria was censored, and it was just a a regulatory uh, piece on the Arab League deliberations on Syria, where I produced um, original material that wasn't in the media. Uh, and then they allowed my piece on Stratfor, calling the opposition liars out. And then never allowed another piece of mine on to be published on the Huffington Post. Um, so it was, you know, well, well, I think it's important because Syria on the world pages of the Huffington Post was the largest story of the last year. And they repeatedly uh, published articles, um, timeline out of Beirut and Amman by correspondents and writers from wire services who had not been to Syria but refused to even publish the first-hand account of one of the Huffington Post's very own bloggers um, on the Middle East, uh, you know, um, on, on the new AOL Huffington Post hybrid. So uh, that was, that was, uh, that was shocking. You know, it was shocking. I, uh, what, what can I say? I mean, it, it's not, you know, you, you talk about Amber Lyons' piece. 
uh, or Amber Lyon um, being censored at CNN. I remember watching her in the early days of her Bahrain coverage and saying, wow, how are they allowing this, you know? Um, and, and I have a, a colleague at the National Review online, um, the, the neoconservative publication, who has also recently seen his Syria pieces, which question the uh, mainstream dominant narratives, um, now being censored. So I think it's happening in all media, and it, it raises questions about, you know, how this is happening in all media, and, uh, you know, the, the, the same old story is fine, which I think is accurate about who owns the media and what their interests are. Well, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was the importance of this narrative in the mainstream media or the NATO-run media. And uh, one of the articles that you wrote was um, reporting about the U.S. Special Forces Unconventional Weapons Manual. And I was wondering, um, can you describe to us what is in this unconventional warfare manual and how that relates to Syria and why having this narrative of, you know, a, a hit list of like, you know, how many have died today and the perception uh, controlled by the mainstream media is so important. Yeah, um, look, I came across the unconventional warfare manual on, on, on an obscure blog somewhere. Um, it wasn't even the manual, it was a link that I, I just uh, came across and my mouth dropped and I ran to my editor at the time and said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is, you know, huge. I think probably for um, old hands at uh, InfoWars, it's probably not uh, as, as much of a revelation, but uh, I mean, clearly when I put it online at Al-Akhbar English, um, it was picked up by numerous alternative U.S. and European media and it was it was an eye opener for a number of people. So I'm always happy to talk about this. It's um, you know the the U.S. decided after Iraq and Afghanistan, which were conventional wars that put a lot of American money, men, and military hardware to use, that um, it, it was it was too expensive a proposition for them. So they created something that's always been there, a manual for. Um, for unconventional warfare and, and declared that for the foreseeable future, U.S. forces will predominantly engage in irregular warfare operations. Um, so what, what does this mean? Well, so the United States government has a perceived foe, let's say the Assad regime or the Iranian regime or the Libyan regime. And, um, they, they, they look at these countries this way. Um, Unconventional warfare is really to get local populations to fight America's wars on its behalf. So they look at a population as a whole, and they, they recognize that there's a small sliver that is very pro-government, and there's a small sliver that's very anti-government. But in the middle, you have a largely uncommitted population. Perhaps they're apathetic. Perhaps they kind of like their government. Perhaps they kind of don't, but they're not moved to do anything about it. Um, as is probably the case with uh, the, 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 the American population. A small sliver that's very pro-Obama, a small sliver that's very anti-Obama, and then an uncommitted middle. Um, and the, the goal of unconventional warfare is to sway the uncommitted middle by using um, psychological means to um, support a rebellion against their government. And this is where, you know, we if you look back in some of the um, revolutions we've seen in Eastern Europe and even before, you see incidents that, you know, now that we have this manual, this blueprint right in front of us, makes you wonder. I mean, there's incidents of snipering. In Syria, for instance, you saw, you know, young children being snipered. Why would the Syrian government want to do this? Um, when at the same time they were engaging with leadership in local towns and uh, and villages and cities across Syria to try to, you know, calm down. So, you know, uh, there, there's, there's a pyramid used in the Unconventional Warfare Manual, which, by the way, um, can be found on my Al-Akhbar English article, a link to it in the first paragraph if anyone wants to read the whole thing. But um, the pyramid actually you know, discusses doing, um, uh, how, how do you sway the middle population? You, you, you engage in, in acts of sabotage. Um, you, you exploit the vulnerabilities of a, of a government. And you, you do things, for instance, like um, um, 
backing or pushing strikes and boycotts at a local level to give a to give the impression of um, uh, widespread populist or discontent within the population. You have um, uh, you, you then you then uh, take it to another level where you have. Um, uh, you know, sabotage in cities, you have um, acts of, well, terrorism, to be quite frankly, in cities. You expand operations and you, you then create a, a national liberation front, which will be militarized, and then you create a national governing body that is supposed to be the voice of the opposition. In this case, the Free Syrian Army and the Syrian National uh, Congress, SNC, um, so, you know, this diagram and, and the explanation in the Unconventional Warfare Manual, when I saw it, absolutely mirrored what we were seeing happening in Syria. And I think in what, what we saw happen in Libya. Um, and what uh, I think the U.S. government was attempting last February in Iran uh, when it kicked off like Twitter activities and whatnot to sort of whip up the populations in Iran. Um, and, and we're seeing this now in Iran. Uh, as well, um, so so it's it's about um, slowly creating perception of um, widespread discontent, um, and then some incidents to to whip up popular anger, um, and then you translate that further into supporting a rebellion. You at, at a certain point, the U.S. Unconventional um, Manual Warfare Manual instructs um, participants to then. Um, solicit the, uh, at that point, you get foreign assistance in the term of equipment, in, in, in the form of equipment, um, cash, um, uh, I think training, and then, you know, then you take it a little bit further, you have increased agitation, um, uh, you know, you infiltrate the police forces, the army, you try to uh, um, solicit the defection of major players in, in the government and in the armed forces and in the police forces and, and any, any government um, affiliated organization. Um, you, you expand front organizations, you, you start upping overt and covert activities. Um, at some point, you know, the United States has hit its forces involved, but more the periphery. Like I said, this unconventional warfare is about saving the American military blood and treasure. You get you get the Arabs to fight your wars for you, and and uh, you know, and more and more guerrilla actions, more and more urban sabotage. You take it to the capital, and then you have a um, you know regime change, basically. Um, so you know, we saw this in Libya. Because, but in Libya, it wasn't the U.S. Remember, the U.S. led from behind the NATO operations, and you know it's questionable whether um, Libya happened so quickly. We we hardly had a chance to take a breath, but it's questionable now. I think whether um, Gaddafi would have been ousted had uh, NATO not been involved, and I think because NATO has not been able to be get involved in Syria because of um, Russian and Chinese veto. Um, uh, you 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 now have the U.S. soliciting. The um, you know tacitly or or, or, or directly uh, we don't know yet the um, um, the involvement of jihadists who are flooding the Syrian borders and carrying out military operations and bringing know-how about uh, urban sabotage and bombings and suicide bombings to Syria. So it's really interesting, uh, especially what you mentioned about the sniping um, and the bombing. Like that actually in the manual to try, try to provoke an uprising. And that's pretty much exactly as we saw by the script that what happened in Syria. And, you know, you mentioned the jihadists um, in Syria. And what I've heard you say before, uh, which is very intriguing, is that Al-Qaeda, you know, we, we label it Al-Qaeda, but the definition of it is, is not exactly as the mainstream media had us believe for over the last decade, that it was this mega organization that had subterranean bases and it was just everywhere. And it seemed to be everywhere that the U.S. needed to attack. But now, of course, as they did, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, uh, when they were trying to kick the Soviets out, they funded and created al-Qaeda. They're doing this again, but um, in, in a different way, because... You have people from, you know, all over uh, the 
world uh, now in across the Middle East, even in Sydney, Australia, and in Europe, taking up and holding the Al Qaeda flag and chanting Osama, Osama. I mean Obama, Obama. We love Osama. So it's become uh, Al Qaeda has become more like an idea, and you know I believe it's it's really been just an idea or a meme that the media has been propelling. And you actually wrote something about this. Uh, in 2009, you wrote an article, Al-Qaeda Under My Bed. And I, I believe you also said that there's an, a new Stratford um, uh, document that come out that's actually admitted, you know, Al-Qaeda is just a meme and uh, a loose rap, you know, group of jihadists that are taking on this ideology. So could you comment on what your theory is? Non Al Qaeda expert, um, the article I wrote in, I think it was January of 2010, um, was called Looking Under My Bed for Al Qaeda, because at that time there were, I think, you know, the US was droning in Yemen and there was uh, an explosion of something, I think, in the south of Jordan, Islamist, Salafist militants. And at the, you know, I, I, and, and the US was taking a very, very uh, suddenly resurgent and active role in the region. And um, I, uh, you know, perhaps with the peace process not working out and its Iranian regime change plans not working out and, and uh, you know, the, the volume against Israel becoming deafening um, globally. So, um, you know, I, I basically argued that um, I'm going to be looking under my bed for Al-Qaeda tonight because they're springing up everywhere all of a sudden. And, you know, whether they're really Al-Qaeda or not was was questionable because um, I recall in, in um, a couple of years ago sitting with Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was um, uh, chief of staff for uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell, and um, you know he said to me, "There are 242 Al Qaeda operatives, you know, um, and 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 we're running after them like they're the biggest national security threat." And he said, "You know." We, we have possibly 10% of Americans who are a bigger threat to national security than 242 Al-Qaeda operatives, um, you know, who are running scared in the Middle East. So, you know, there were never a lot, and I think experts state this, and every day or week you're hearing that another Al-Qaeda operative or several Al-Qaeda operatives have been taken out by drone attacks. And um, so, you know, what, what's happened to that number? Can there possibly be any remaining. And I did notice that everywhere the U.S. went in the region, when they did start droning activities, Al-Qaeda type groups were springing up in other areas. And I think, by and large, it is the United States that has made the largest investment in Al-Qaeda um, by far, you know, because everywhere they go, they, they, um, they grow the global brand and invest in the expansion of Al Qaeda franchises. You know, the, the whole idea behind why Al Qaeda even came to be is because of, you know, American troops being on sacred soil in Saudi Arabia. And this was, um, you know, a sacrilege and we wouldn't tolerate it anymore. So initially, you know, other than the um, antagonism that the uh, Al-Qaeda founders had towards the Saudi regime, the Al-Saud family, uh, and many of those monarchies, there was huge antagonism towards the U.S., um, U.S. military in particular, and, and Israel, of course. But now you see something different. I agree with you 100%. Al-Qaeda has morphed into an idea, a brand, a convenient scapegoat for just about any operation um, the U.S. and its allies want to undertake in uh, in the Muslim world at large. Um, and uh, uh, today you have um, Al-Qaeda more, more as an idea. You have young men who are frustrated, angry, um, disenfranchised, who are, you know, wearing the Al-Qaeda flag and Al-Qaeda black um, to, you know, represent this idea. Now, the problem is, um, in some of these um, areas, Al Qaeda is on the same side as the United States. It's avowed enemy, and increasingly, certainly in places like Syria and in Libya, and even um, against Iran, where you see militant Salafists engaging, um, uh, where the U.S. used to fuel the Salafist militant Salafist resentment. We now see the U.S. engaging militant Salafism. 
And I think you could, you know, very appropriately call it, call them um, America's Islamist handmaidens. Because certainly in the battles we're seeing in the Middle East, um, the U.S. is either tacitly or directly um, uh, allowing the growth or involvement of, of these type of individuals um, uh, into conflict. Um, the United States very erroneously thinks that it can control these elements or that um, it, it, it can allow it to get to the point where there's controlled chaos. Um, unfortunately for the people of these regions, um, these, these militant Salafists are just as much abhorred in the region as they are by, you know, in, in the you know, Western media. Um, so it's terrible for the region. This region doesn't need controlled chaos. It needs, it needs building bricks to get to the next level. And frankly, um, you know, it's time that the United States made a really strong exit from this region. I'm talking, you know, rolling back their bases and getting the hell out. You know, nobody wants American money. Take your, you know, ill-intended, um, conditional uh, financial assistance to and get out because, um, you know, no matter what kind of credit Obama and others are taking about um, bringing freedom and democracy to this region, it is the United States that is back the most brutal and undemocratic regimes in this region. They continue to do so with the Gulf monarchies. Um, and, uh, you know, their two biggest bases are the big military, sorry, military bases in Qatar, the largest in the region, and um, their largest naval base in the region is in Bahrain. You know, so um, the, 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 the U.S. government, I think, has um, allocated, um, has, has now agreed to sell the um, Gulf Cooperation Council member countries, um, I think it's $129 billion of weapons. Um, this is since the Arab awakening uh, took off. So um, it, it, it's crazy. It's uh, they're, 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 they're not helping. The U.S. is not helping whatsoever towards, um, you know, helping populations move towards any kind of freedom or democracy. It's um, absolutely the contrary. They've, uh, the U.S. government has sucked it up where it's needed to uh, with Egypt and with Tunisia, but it sure as hell isn't going to let anyone else get away with it and is very much um, behind the counter-revolution swing through this region. And in my view, the counter-revolutions are a distraction from the, the, the countries most likely to be hit by public a uh, widespread popular protest. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we saw those in what, what happened. It was Tunisia with Ben Ali, and it was, um, it was Egypt's Mubarak, and around the same time, um, Yemen and Bahrain caught on fire, and uh, we, we were hearing, um, you know, about street demonstrations and a few beatings um, of, in Jordan, and these are all um, U.S. US supported governments, and uh, it was it was essential to 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 move things away uh, from 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 these U.S. proxy states because um, otherwise, you know, the U.S. would be out of the region, and uh, and so you had Libya very conveniently um, uh, stirred up, and and now Syria. Uh, uh, so, you know, and, and of course, Iran stays on the map. And I remember an article, I remember thinking when all this started in 2011, like, uh, you know, how is the U.S. going to tolerate this? And uh, David Sanger of the New York Times, who I don't love, he writes, um, you know, silly stories on the Iranian nuclear issue. But uh, he, he absolutely, I think, hit the nail on the head when he talked about the Obama administration looking at every single one of these uprisings in the Arab world through the prism of how this affects Iranian, Iran's growing hegemony and growing influence in the region. Um, so, you know, even if we would in the United States be okay with um, reforms in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, not while Iran was gaining, um, and we would not let Iran gain. And so, you know, this is the story of, sadly, the story of the Arab Spring. It's become, you know, um, the American-Saudi counter-revolution. Um, and, uh, you know, Hopefully, and I, I tend to think, I think as others perhaps who are in the world of Middle East geopolitics, that Syria might actually be the final battleground on this because Syria was so badly um, done uh, and, and I mean, so I guess, um, you know, it was, there was a lot of chutzpah in what the U.S. did in Syria. Definitely. Um, really gargantuan balls to go into a country and from 
you know, one end to the other, whip up these kind of revolts. And not only that, but completely lie and misrepresent, you know, what's going on there. And, uh, and, and, and what happened in Syria that's interesting is, um, other growing, um, global hegemons. I mean, we're, we're going towards a multilateral world. So those other players stepped up, the BRICS in particular. And most notably, um, the Russians and the Chinese stood up and said, no way, no more. You know, you've, um, you've shot your wad. This is the last UN Security Council, um, resolution for this kind of warfare was Libya. It's not going to happen in Syria. And we see the Russians increasingly wrapping their arms around Syria. And I think, you know, it's a wise thing to do. It's the other BRIC countries like uh, India and Brazil also agree with this, that Syria is uh, for Syrians to resolve. And uh, it's, it's not for anybody else, not for neighboring states. It's not for um, international players. It's for Syrians to resolve. And it's probably the only way to do it because right now they're um, importing foreigners uh, to, to help win a battle that is unwinnable. And this Syrian battlefield is, I think, going to be the last battle the United States is going to fight in the Middle East. Um, it's... Uh, it's it's lost its un it's lost its conventional wars, um, and uh, it's uh, it it has I think you know if Syria had happened in three months nobody would have noticed these games nobody would have noticed this irregular warfare, but because it's been now 19 months so much is under scrutiny I think uh, I think many people in the region have started to see the the level and intensity of games and machinations that have gone into, um, you know, uh, thwarting the will of a population and creating rebellion. And I don't think it's going to happen easily again. You know, certainly the Iranians are on watch. Oh, I let's hope for the best in, in this case. You know, I, I do get a lot of hope from just listening to you talk about that. And I'm really thankful that you came to talk to us today. I certainly learned a lot. And um, I guess I'll be speaking to you um, again soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot, Charmaine. And again, your your uh, newspaper is called Al Akbar, is it? And where people no, can I, access I, your. I write. Uh, they can look for this article in Al Akbar English. Um, I've published um, most of my articles on Syria and al -Akbar English, but I also have my blog uh, at mideastshuffle.com, which uh, my other pieces in the New York Times and salon.com and Huffington Post also appear. Um, and I can always be followed on uh, Twitter at S. Narwani. Okay. Thanks again, Sharmi. Thank you. Bye. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. Mm -hmm.